Hey everyone, so we are still on part two, so let's continue. An apparition at the door. Once I got up in the middle of the night because I was thirsty, and I saw Mom standing outside Augie's room. Her hand was on the doorknob, her forehead leaning on the door, which was ajar. She wasn't going in his room or stepping out, just standing right outside the door as if she was listening to the sound of his breathing as he slept. The hallway lights were out. The only thing illuminating her was the blue nightlight in Augie's bedroom. She looked ghost-like standing there, or maybe I should say angelic. I tried to walk back into my room without disturbing her, but she heard me and walked over to me. Is Augie okay? I asked. I knew that was that sometimes he would wake up choking on his own saliva if he accidentally turned over on his back. Oh, he's fine, she said, wrapping her arms around me. She walked me back into my room, pulled the covers over me, and kissed me goodnight. She never explained what she was doing outside his door, and I never asked. I wonder how many nights she stood outside his door and wondered if she'd ever stood out my door like that. Breakfast Can you pick me up from school today? I asked the next morning, smearing some cream cheese on my bagel. Mom was making August's lunch, American cheese on whole wheat bread, soft enough for Augie to eat, while August said eating oatmeal at the, sat eating oatmeal at the table. Dad was getting ready to go to work. Now that I was in high school, the new school routine was going to be that Dad and I would take the subway together in the morning, which meant he is having to leave 15 minutes earlier than usual. Then I'd get off at my stop, and he'd keep going. And Mom was going to pick me up after school in the car. I was going to call Miranda's mother to see if she could drive you home again, Mom answered. No, Mom, I said quickly. You pick me up, or I'll just take the subway. You know I don't want to take... I don't want you to take the subway by yourself yet, she answered. Mom, I'm 15. Everybody my age takes the subway by themselves. She can take the subway home, said Dad from the other room, adjusting his tie as he stepped into the kitchen. Why can't Miranda's mom just pick her up again, Mom argued with him. She's old enough to take the subway by herself, Dad insisted. Mom looked at both of us. Is something going on? She didn't address her question to either one of us in particular. You know, you would know if you had come back to check on me, I said spitefully, like you said you would. Oh God, Via, said Mom, remembering now how she had completely ditched me last night. She put down the knife she was, cut, she was using to cut Augie's grapes in half. Still a choking hazard for him because of the size of his palate. I'm so sorry. I fell asleep in Augie's room. By the time I woke up, I know, I know, I nodded indifferently. Mom came over, put her hand on my cheek, and lifted my face to look at her. I'm really, really sorry, she whispered. I could tell she was. It's okay, I said. Via. Mom, it's fine. This time I meant it. She looked so genuinely sorry, I just wanted to let her off the hook. She kissed and hugged me, then returned to the grapes. So it's something going on with Miranda, she asked. Just that she's acting like a complete jerk, I said. Miranda's not a jerk, Augie quickly chimed in. She can be, I yelled. Believe me. Okay then, I'll pick you up, no problem, Mom said decisively sweeping the half grapes into a snack bag with the side of her knife. That was the plan all along anyway. I'll pick Augie up from school in the car and then we'll pick you up. We'll probably get there about a quarter to four. No, I said firmly before she'd even finished. Isabel, she can take the subway, Dad said impatiently. She's a big girl now. She's reading War and Peace for crying out loud. What does war and peace what does war and peace have to do with anything? answered Mom, clearly annoyed. It means you don't have to pick her up in the car. She's a little girl like she's a little girl, he said sternly. Via, are you ready? Get your bag and let's go. 
I'm ready, I said, pulling on my backpack. My backpack. Bye, Mom. Bye, Augie. I kissed them both quickly and headed toward the door. Do you even have a metro card? Mom said after me. Of course she has a metro card, answered Dad. Fully exasperated. Yeesh, Mom. Stop worrying so much. Bye, he said, kissing her on the cheek. Bye, big boy, he said to August, kissing him on the top of his head. I'm proud of you. Have a great day. Bye, Daddy. You too. Dad and I jogged down the stoop stairs and headed down the block. Call me after school before you get on the subway, Mom yelled at me from the window. I didn't even turn around, but waved my hand at her so she'd know I heard her. Dad did turn around, walking backward for a few steps. War and peace, Isabel, he called out smiling as he pointed at me. War and peace. Genetics 101. Both sides of Dad's family were Jews from Russia and Poland. Papa's grandparents fled the, the pogroms and ended up in NYC at the turn of the century. Tata's parents flew, fled the Nazis and ended up in Argentina in the 40s. Papa and Tata met at a dance on the Lower East Side while she was in town visiting a cousin. They got married, moved to Bayside, and had Dad and Uncle Ben. Mom's side of the family is from Brazil, except for her mother, my beautiful grands, and her dad, Agosto, who died before I was born. The rest of Mom's family, all of her glamorous aunts, uncles, and cousins, still live in Alto Leblon, a Red Sea suburb south of Rio. Grands and Agosto moved to... Boston in the early 60s and had mom and aunt Kate who married who's married to uncle Porter Mom and dad met at Brown University and had been together ever since Isabel and Nate like two peas in a pod they moved to New York Right after college had me a few years later then moved to a brick townhouse in North River Heights the hipsty stroller capital of upper upper Manhattan when I was about a year old. Not one person in the exotic mix of my family, Gene Poole, has ever shown any obvious signs of having what August has. I've poured over grainy sepia pictures of long dread relatives in babushkas, black and white snapshots of distant cousins in crisp white linen suits, soldiers in uniforms, ladies with beehive hairdos, Polaroids of bell-bottomed teenagers, and long-haired hippies, and not once have I been able to detect even the slightest trace of August's face in their faces. Not a one. But after August was born, my parents underwent genetic counseling. They went they were told that August had what seemed to be a previously unknown type of Mendy Pulofacial Dioxis caused by an autosominal recessive mutation in the TCOFI gene, which is located on the chromosome 5, complicated by a hemi hemifacial microsomal character characteristic of OAV spectrum. Sometimes these mutations occur during pregnancy. Sometimes they're inherited from one parent carrying the dominant gene. Sometimes they're created by the interaction of many genes, genes possibly in combination with the environmental factors. This is called multifactorial inheritance. In August's case, the doctors were able to identify one of the single nucleotide detection mutations that made war on his face. The weird thing is, though, you'd never know it from looking at them. Both my parents carry that, mut that mutant gene, and I carry it too. The Punnett Square. If I have children, there's a one in two chance that I will pass on the de detective gene 
a defective gene to them. That doesn't mean they'll look like August, that, but they'll carry the gene that got double-dosed in August and helped make, them, make him the way he is. If I marry someone who has the same defective gene, there's a 1 in 2 chance that our kids will carry the gene and look totally normal, a 1 in 4 chance that our kids will not carry the gene at all, and a 1 in 4 chance that our kids will look like August. If August has children with someone who doesn't have a trace of the gene, there's a 100% possibility that their kids will inherit the gene, but a 0% chance that their kids will have a double dose of it like August, which means they'll carry the gene no matter what, but they could totally, they could look totally normal. If he marries someone who has the gene, their kids will have the same odds as my kids. This only explains the part of August, August that, that's explainable. There's that other part of his genetic makeup that's not inherited, but just incredibly bad luck. Countless doctors have drawn little tic-tac-toe grids for my parents over the years to try to explain the genetic lottery to them. Genetics use this Punnett square to determine inheritance, recessive, and dominant genes, possibilities and chances, probabilities and chances, but for all they know, they're more, there's more that they don't know. They can try to forecast the odds, but they can't guarantee them. They use terms like germline mosaic, mosaicism, chromosome rearrangement, or delayed mutation to explain why their science is not un- exact science. I actually like how doctors talk. I like the sound of science. I like how words you don't understand explain things you can't understand. There are countless people under words like germline, mosaicism, chromosome rearrangement, or delayed mutation. Countless babies who'll never be born like mine.